Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to my video channel. Thanks so much for joining me for yet another video in our Rust programming tutorial series. In this particular video, we're going to be exploring another feature of the Rust language, which is known as operator overloading. Now, before we get into how to implement operator overloading, let's actually talk about what operator overloading is. Well, as you probably know, pretty much every programming language out there allows you to use common mathematical operators like the plus sign, the minus sign, the division sign, which is basically just a forward slash. You also have the modulo operator, which allows you to get the leftovers after a division operation, which is typically the percent sign. And you can actually customize the implementations of these operators yourself, which is known as operator overloading. Now, normally when you're operating on the primitive types in Rust, like a floating point 32-bit value, or maybe an unsigned 8-bit integer, or maybe a signed 64-bit integer, the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulo operators are going to have a pretty well understood effect, right? But what happens if you implement a custom data structure into your Rust application, like a person or a dog? or some kind of animal, and you want to implement some kind of addition operation between those custom object types. For example, when you have, let's say, two different people, right? You have a person that has a first name and a last name and a birth date, maybe a social security number. And let's say that you have two instances of that person struct. Well, what happens when you take the person number one and you add it to person number two? Well, there's a variety of different functions that you might think could result from that, but let's just say for the sake of example that these two people get married. So the result of the addition operation isn't some kind of numeric number or value. It's actually going to be a custom construct known as a marriage that ultimately points to those two individual instances of people. Those are the two individuals that chose to get married. And so the resulting object from the addition operation could be a marriage data structure. It's really totally up to you exactly what you want to result from the different implementations of these operators. But for now, just be aware that you can actually take the core operators that work on primitive types by default, and you can actually implement those behaviors for your own custom data structures in Rust. So under the Rust by example book here, there is a brief article that talks about operator overloading. This is a really simplistic example that doesn't really show any kind of real world concepts. It's just kind of a foobar example that allows, allows you to see the custom implementation here. But we're actually going to take a couple of real world approaches, one of which I just mentioned being a marriage between two individuals. And we're going to go ahead and implement that in Rust code. And then we'll take a look at another example. So make sure that you watch to the end of this video to see what that other example is. We're going to overload the addition operator again for another real world example. So if you head over to the standard crate here and go to the ops module here, so if you're in the standard crate documentation here, you can just head over to modules. And then of course, there's a bunch of different modules here, some of which we've looked at and then head down to ops here. And if we take a look at the ops module here, the way that we can actually implement these custom behaviors or overload these operators in Rust is to implement certain traits here. Now we've already taken a look at traits and super traits, and we've seen how to implement traits, but these traits are kind of special because they actually allow you to modify the default behavior of these operators for your custom types. So this is really cool functionality. We've got the add trait here that allows us to specify what happens when we add items together. We also have things like the division trait. We have things like the subtraction. So down here we've got sub and we've also got uh, multiplication or just MUL for short. And then I think we have one for modulo operations here as well, but I'm not seeing it. Let me just do a quick search for the percent sign here. So it's actually called the remainder operator in this particular case. And so that's the one that you would implement if you wanted the leftovers from a division operation. 
So what we're going to be doing is taking a look primarily at this add method right here, or I should say add trait. And if we take a look at the add trait and look at the definition of it, it allows us to specify the type that we get as an output. So in the case of having two custom data structures as person objects, then when we add those together, we would get a marriage struct as a result. So a marriage struct could have pointers to the two individuals, as well as having a date that the two individuals got married, as well as perhaps a location. You know, that could be a country, it could be a state, it could be a city, whatever you want to use for the location. Um, there could be other types of things that we want to represent on a marriage as well, but a marriage is going to be a custom data structure that ultimately points to the two individuals that got married. And in other examples, you might have some other kind of output type. So this is your opportunity to declare what the output type of the operation is going to be. And then the only method that is required by the add trait here is the add function here. And this is just going to take in itself the current instance that we're operating on, as well as the right hand side or RHS input here. And that's the second instance of that type that we want to add. Now, something else that's really cool is that you can actually implement this as a generic type as well. So if you want to add a different type to a type number one, let's say we wanted to add a dog to a person. So rather than having a marriage result from that, we could have an ownership relationship where when you add a dog to a person, that dog could become a pet or an, uh, the, the person could become an owner of that particular dog as a kind of person to pet relationship instead. So again, it's completely up to you how you want to do that, but you can actually add a different type to whatever type it is that you're calling the add method on. And again, depending on what type it is that you're adding to that type, then that could kind of change the actual implementation of this particular trait. So let's go ahead and take a look at some code and we'll, we'll write this completely from scratch. So there's no smoke and mirrors. You'll actually see how to implement this kind of functionality completely from scratch in your program. And before we get into the actual code, I just wanted to remind you to support my channel. I'm an independent content creator. So any kind of support that you can provide to my channel is extremely helpful. So head out and subscribe. Also check out the different playlists that I have featured on my channel here. I've got one called Rust Programming Tutorial. And I've got some other ones on things like virtualization on Linux with LXD, open source software in general, PowerShell automation, Amazon Web Services training, and a whole bunch of other interesting stuff coming down the pipeline as well. So make sure that you keep an eye on these playlists. Also, if you leave a like on the video, leave a comment, and just let me know what you thought of this video by the end. If you learned something new, I really hope you did, then leave a like on the video, and we'll uh, continue bringing you some fresh content. All right, so I am connected here in VS Code to one of my remote Linux virtual machines, and I've already got the Rust runtime installed. So we're just going to create a new project here. And just to show you, I'm currently on Rust 1.71, and that should work perfectly fine. I think I could technically upgrade to 1.72 or to nightly, but for now, we'll just stick with the current version. So what I'm going to do is just create a new project folder here. So we'll say cargo new. And we'll say op underscore overload. And now we'll go ahead and open up that project in my editor here. So let's open up the op overload directory here. And this should have a very basic scaffolded project for a Rust binary. So in cargo.toml here, we don't have any dependencies. This is the name of our project. Make sure that the name of your project doesn't conflict with any Rust keywords or module names or things like that, because you can potentially run into issues. So if I called this like Surday, for example, that's probably not a good idea because there's already an existing Surday crate out there. All right, so what we're going to do is just go into our main.rs file here. We'll eliminate the hello world statement that we have. And for starters, what we're going to do is just define a couple of data structures. So up here at the top of my program, we're going to define a person as a data structure. We'll give it a first name field with a string data type and a last name as a string data type as well. And then we're also going to define a marriage data structure because we want to be able to take two person instances and add them together with the add trait. And then we're going to implement that functionality to actually result in a marriage object. 
So what we're going to do is say struct marriage, and then we need to have two different pointers, one to the husband, one to the wife. We also need a location and a date field to represent what a marriage looks like from a data standpoint, right? So for starters, we're going to have a husband field here, and we're going to set that to a person. We're going to have a wife and set that to a person. We're also going to have a uh, let's see, location, and we'll just make that a string type directly on the marriage. And then if we want to have a date, we're actually going to need to bring in chrono. So if you go back and watch my video on chrono, that'll kind of show you how to work with some dates and times. So for now, we'll just say cargo add chrono into our project. And then we're going to set the marriage date field to the chrono. And then we'll go into the naive module here. Actually, I think we can just do naive date right here on the root of the chrono module, and that'll allow us to specify the date that the marriage occurred. So now what we want to do is basically construct two different person instances, each with their first and last names, and then we want to be able to add those people together. So for starters, in our main function down here, we're just going to kind of proceed as if we're not doing operator overloading, and we're going to see the problem that you'll result in if you try to add these structs together. So let's do a person one, and we'll set this to a new person struct with a first name of Trevor dot two string, and then we'll set the last name to Sullivan dot two string. And then I need a semicolon there. And then we'll just duplicate that line down and we'll say let person number two equal, let's say Nancy, and then Jones as the last name. So let's say that these two people are going to get married. And so we want to be able to say let marriage equal person one plus person two. Now, as you can see, this in theory would work perfectly fine if these two operands right here were numeric types. If we had like zero and one as integer values, we could add zero to one and we could get one as a result, or we could add five and 10 together and get 15 as a result. But what exactly does it mean when you add two people together? Well, we get an error from the Rust compiler here saying that we can't add a person to a person because as far as Rust knows, there is no operator that allows us to add two people together. So we have to basically tell Rust how exactly we want to implement the functionality of adding a person to another person. So that is where the trait comes into play, standard ops add. And this is part of the prelude, and we haven't really talked about preludes before, but a prelude is basically just a set of default imports that you get from a particular crate. So in the standard crate over here, we actually have a prelude and this includes certain types out of the box. And some of those are from the standard ops module right here, but we can also be a little bit more explicit in our declaration here by just saying use standard ops and then add. And that will allow us to explicitly import this particular trait if it's not already imported by the prelude. So what we're gonna do now that we've imported this trait is we're going to go ahead and implement it. And you can ignore this warning because it's basically just telling us that we've imported this right here, but we haven't actually referenced the add trait anywhere in our program yet. So this is just a warning. It's not going to prevent you from compiling. Uh, of course, we will get the error from our program saying that we can't add two people together. But uh, for now, we're going to go ahead and take the compiler's recommendation and implement the add trait for person. So down here, we're going to say impl add for the person data type here. And you're going to have to implement both the type parameter, which declares the type of object that's going to result from this operation. So for starters, we're going to say type. And it already knows from the metadata on the trait that the type output equals something. And then we have to specify that the resulting object type that we get from adding two people together is a marriage. So what we're going to do now is implement the add function right here. So you can see automatically VS Code's uh, Rust Analyzer extension knows that we have to implement this add function right here. 
And so we're going to assume that we're going to always start with the husband and then we'll add the wife as the right hand side argument here. That's just going to be kind of by convention here. There's nothing enforcing that. But if you implemented a custom husband type and a custom wife type, then you could start with the husband and implement add on husband instead of just the generic person type. But for the sake of example, this is going to work perfectly fine. We'll just use a single type as person because I don't want to complicate things too much. All right, so what we want to do now is make sure that we satisfy this add function here by returning the self output type. So basically the person output type for the add trait is going to be a marriage. So this add function right here, in order to satisfy this type declaration here, we have to make sure that we return a marriage object. So anytime that we call add on a person here, we're going to construct a new marriage. So we'll say new marriage equals a marriage instance here. And then we need to provide all of the inputs to the marriage data structure. So we have location, we have date, we have husband and wife. So I'm just gonna set husband to self. So basically whatever person we call the add method on is going to be considered the husband. And then we'll set wife to the right hand side argument, which is the second person instance that we're passing in to the add function. So then what we're going to do is set the location. For now, I'm just going to hard code a location like Arizona and say dot to string to turn that into a heap allocated string. And then we're going to set the date. So the date of the marriage is going to be chrono. And then we'll go into naive module and we'll use the now function, which I think is in there. So let me figure out where that is coming from. And it looks like it's not in there. So let me figure out where that's from. So we'll head over here to the Rust Chrono docs and check out where that now function comes from. We'll just do a search for now and it looks like it's under local. So chrono offset local is where that's going to be. Totally forgot. That's where it is. So we'll say chrono local and then we'll try to go into the what is it offset I think. And so let's see. Let me just pause this really quick. So it's actually under the chrono offset module. Then we have the local type and there is a now function on here that we can call. So if we do now, we can grab the current date and time with the offset. Let's go into chrono offset module local and then there should be now. Now when we call now on local here, it's going to give us a date time, but we just want the date. So we'll call dot date naive in order to retrieve just the date and discard the time because generally speaking, we want to know the day that somebody got married. We don't necessarily care about the specific time, right? Of course, maybe you do. And so in that case, you could just change the data type to a naive date time instead of just the naive date. All right, so now we've got this new marriage constructed here. Now we need to go ahead and just return that back from the add function to satisfy this return type. So what we'll do is just say return new marriage, and that should automatically satisfy the code that we've already written down here. So as you can see, we're no longer getting this error from the compiler saying that it doesn't know how to add a person to a person because we are able to accomplish this. So if we go ahead and say print line and then we'll plug in and say X got married to Y on X date. All right. So on Z date, I should say. So we have X, Y and Z as three inputs here. So now we're going to reference the marriage dot husband dot first name and then we'll do marriage dot wife dot first name. And then we'll do marriage dot date as the final argument here. And of course, I need an exclamation point there because this is a macro. So this is how we can basically plug in some variables from this marriage or some uh, field values, I should say, from this marriage data structure. We're going into the marriage. We're grabbing the husband, which is a unique person. We're grabbing the wife, which is also a unique person. And then we're just grabbing the first name fields. And then finally, we're just grabbing the date field, which is this chrono naive date object. So let's go ahead and run this. 
And as it as you can see, we get Trevor got married to Nancy on 2023-09-19. And of course, if you wanted to customize the date with something different rather than hard coding whatever now or today is, then you could specify that as some kind of argument to this as well. Or maybe just go ahead and modify it after the fact. If you make it mutable here, you could go into marriage and say marriage.date equals some other date and time or just date rather. All right, so that is a simple example of how we can add a person to another person. Now let's take a look at another example and we're gonna use a grocery bill as our example. So if you go to the grocery store, you know, you load up your cart with a bunch of items, maybe some cottage cheese, cans of peaches, maybe some carrots, maybe some corn, cabbage, that kind of thing. Let's say that we want to create a grocery bill, right? So you walk up to the checkout with your cart of items and you basically want to create a bill and you wanna add all of those items to that bill and then you've got a certain tax rate and then you can get your total with the tax rate applied, right? So in order to implement this, we need to kind of represent each item that we purchase from the grocery store and we also need to be able to represent the bill of the total list of items that we have and then we also need to be able to represent the tax rate for that particular bill. Of course, in some cases, you might have a unique tax rate for each item, depending on what category it's in, that kind of thing. But we're just going to keep things simple and say that our entire bill has a singular tax rate. So in order to implement this particular example, we're going to start off by creating a data structure here to represent each item. So we'll say a grocery item. And then we're going to create another structure for grocery bill. And for grocery item here, this is kind of our most broken down type. And so this is going to be a name of string. And then the price for that item is going to be, let's say, a floating point 32-bit value. So maybe $2.23 for a bag of carrots, right? So now under grocery bill, we need to have something like items. And this item list would basically be a VEC of type grocery item. So this VEC here is going to allow us to have one or more grocery items or zero or more technically in our entire bill. And then let's also do something like tax rate and we'll set our tax rate to a floating point 32 bit value. So if your tax rate is maybe on food like 2.3% or 4.7%, we can represent that as a floating point value. So now this is a little bit different because in this case, we have a different relationship. So instead of having two distinct persons and a marriage that simply points to those two persons, now we have individual grocery items, but we have a grocery bill type that aggregates all of those items together. And something else that we'll want to do is to implement a calculate total function on the grocery bill. So we can basically add all of the items together, multiply it by the tax rate, and that would be the total for the bill. So down here, we'll just say impl grocery bill because we wanna implement a method on the grocery bill. And then we'll do fn calculate total and we'll take self as an input argument here so that we can call this on the instance of the grocery bill. And then basically we just want to return a floating point 32 bit value that represents the total payment for that particular bill, right? So we'll go ahead and implement this a little bit later. So we'll just do to do right here. And now what we can do is start by implementing the functionality to add a grocery item to the grocery bill. So essentially what we want to be able to do down here, let's say slash slash grocery example, and up here we'll say marriage example. And so down under the grocery example, we want it to instantiate a new bill, right? So you walk up to the self-checkout machine, as I often do. I like self-checkout. I don't know about you, but I'm a, a, a very firm believer in self-checkout just faster for me. I can scan the things when I need to. And uh, if I need any help, I can always talk to somebody, right? So what we're going to do under this is say new bill equals a grocery bill. And for starters, we're going to initialize the grocery bill with a VEC of grocery items. And we're just going to say new. And then what we're going to do is specify our tax rate. And let's just say that the tax rate on groceries is 2.7.
Now, right here, I also need a double colon here because when we are instantiating a new vec and calling the new method on it, we need to use this syntax. I believe this is TurboFish syntax here where we specify the generic type that we want as the vec type. I might not even need that since I specify the data type in the data structure. And sure enough, it is able to infer that this is a vec of grocery items because that is what we declared up in our grocery bill type right here. All right, so now we've created this new grocery bill, and what we want what we want to do is be able to instantiate certain grocery items and then add those items to the bill. So what we'll do is say let new or er, new item or let's say let carrots to be a little bit more clear in our code here. We'll set it to a grocery item. We'll give the item a name of bag of carrots one pound dot two string, and then for the price. We'll just set it to 2.2 US dollars. And of course, you could use whatever unit of measure you want to for the currency, as well as the product itself. You probably prefer kilograms instead of pounds, but in the US, we mainly use pounds. So I'm just going to stick with that. And then let's say, how about uh, cheese, cottage cheese? So we'll set this equal to a grocery item, and the name will be cottage cheese, 12 ounces, and dot two string. And then we'll set the price for that to about $3.4. So what we want to be able to do is say new bill plus carrots plus cheese. And that should ultimately add these grocery items to the grocery bill, right? So the implementation of the add trait is going to be a little bit different. When we took a look at how to implement the add trait with a person, and a person, right? The two operands are our people, person one and person two. Those are both the same data type. Now, in this case, we're actually going to take a grocery bill and we want to add a grocery item, which is a different structure type, right? So what we want to do is make sure that when we implement the add method or the add trait, I should say, for the grocery bill, we want to specify the generic type that we're actually adding in this case is going to be a grocery item. So we'll say impl add for grocery bill, but this time, instead of implementing the add trait by itself, we're actually going to say impl add and then specify that the right hand side type is not a grocery bill. We don't want to add a grocery bill to a grocery bill. We want to add a grocery item to a grocery bill. So we need to specify this generic type grocery item as the type that we're going to call add on. So, well, I shouldn't say that. It's actually the type that we're passing in to add because the right-hand side of the plus operator is what we're passing in. We're actually calling the add method on the grocery bill type. So what we're going to do is implement the type. And the type that we're going to get back from this operation, when we add an item to a grocery bill, we want to get the grocery bill with the newly added item back as the result. So the output from this operation is going to be a grocery bill. Now for our function here, function add, we want to return a grocery bill back. So we're of course going to use self as the output type here. And we're going to take the grocery item as input and we're going to add it to the vec of items in the grocery bill. Now, when we implement the add trait here, something that's important to note is that self, which is the grocery bill, that's a pointer to the grocery bill itself, the instance of it, that is going to be an immutable reference. So we actually need to take a mutable reference to self because we need to be able to mutate the vec that is contained by this grocery bill. So one of the first things that we need to do is say, let mute bill equals self. And so this will allow us to get a mutable reference to the current grocery bill so that we can add items to the VEC that the bill contains. So now what we're going to do is take this grocery item that's being passed on the right hand side of the plus operator, and we're going to push that onto the existing VEC. So if the VEC is empty, which is the default value that we started with right down here, then we're just going to push that new item onto the VEC, and the VEC should now have one item. So what we're going to do is come up here and say bill dot items. So that refers to the VEC of grocery items. 
and then we'll call the push method here on the vec and all we need to do is pass in the right hand side and then we'll go ahead and return the updated bill so we're just going to return bill as the type here because we need to return the grocery bill back from the add function here to satisfy this particular trait so this right here is the implementation of our add method to take a grocery item as input on the right hand side and be able to push that onto the vec of items for the grocery bill which is this field right here so we need to get a mutable reference we add or push the new grocery item onto the vec and then finally we just return the updated bill so now what we need to do is to capture the result of this operation right here so in order of operations right here what's going to happen is we're going to take the grocery bill in the new bill variable here and that's going to need to be mutable because we need to be able to alter the state of the vec and then we want to add carrots which is a grocery item to the new bill so this right here is going to be one operation and then the next time that we call the operation again we're going to have a bill resulting from this left hand side operation right here so then we're going to take this new bill that we get and we're going to call plus again on the bill and we're going to add the cheese which is another grocery item to that bill and you can do that as many times as you want to fill up that vec and then at the end we'll calculate the total including tax by multiplying the tax value on it so we'll go ahead and say bill equals new bill actually we'll say new bill equals new bill plus carrots plus cheese and then after we update the new bill we're going to do new bill dot calculate total and so now what we need to do is actually implement the code for calculate total here to take the value of all of the items multiply that by the tax rate and then add the tax to the final value so what we're going to do here is just implement a simple function and we'll take all of the items from the vec so we'll say let total let's say items total equal self dot items so that's the vec then we're going to grab an iterator from the vec and i've got another video that talks about iterators in a fair amount of depth and one of the functions that we cover in there is the fold function and so i'm going to start with an accumulator value of zero as a floating point 32 bit number because we're going to add each price from each of these items which is a floating point 32 bit value to the accumulator and then at the very end of the fold function that accumulator value is returned back to this variable right here called items total so that'll give us the total of the items before tax so in here we need to specify a closure that takes the current accumulator value and the current item that we're iterating across and all we're going to do is say return a which is the current accumulator value that starts at zero and then add the current item dot price to that accumulator and then the final result is going to be items total right here then what we want to do is say let tax value equal the items total and multiply that by the percentage of our tax rate which in this case is going to be 5.5 now in this particular example instead of specifying a percentage as this 2.7 value here so that I don't have to convert 2.7 as a number to a percentage I'm actually just going to hard code the percentage right here so I'm going to say 0 0.027 which is 2.7 percent represented as a floating point value so then what we'll do is just multiply items total by self dot tax rate and that should give us the final tax value so then all we have to do is take the total of the items plus the value of the tax and return that as a floating point 32 bit value so we'll just say return items total plus the tax value and that's going to give us our result for calculate total here so now what we'll do is say let total equal the result from calculate total and we'll say print line the total of your grocery bill is and we'll put a placeholder in there actually we'll just do total and close it off with a curly brace so just to review really quickly we have a new bill being created here with a, an empty vec of grocery items and a tax rate of 2.7 percent we have two grocery items here 
We take the bill and we add those grocery items by overloading the add operator in the implementation for add of type grocery item right up here. And then we calculate the results by implementing this custom calculate total function on our grocery bill type. And then we simply return the result. So let's go ahead and run this. And as you can see, the total of your grocery bill is 5.7512. Of course, you could use math rounding to get the value down to 5.75 so that you only have two decimal points of precision. But for now, we're just going to leave it as is. So the key learning points from this video are that you can overload operators by using the add trait, sub trait, mall trait, div trait, and rem trait for modulo. And that's going to allow you to basically override the operator for your own custom data structures in Rust. So if you want to be able to add items together, this is how you would do it. And feel free to follow the same similar pattern here for the other traits that we reviewed over in the ops module somewhere right over here. So in any case, the documentation here for Rust by example doesn't show all of them. It only shows add. But again, the traits are going to be pretty similar to each other. So um, just feel free to take a look at the documentation for things like sub. And sub is basically the same thing where you just have a right-hand side as a an optional generic. You don't have to use the generic type. But if you want to add a different type to whatever type you're implementing the add or subtract traits on, then you do need to specify the generic type. And then it just takes the right hand side value, right? You have your left hand and your right hand side operators, operands, I should say. You've got the plus sign or subtract or multiply or divide as the operator. And then whatever object is going to result from that is going to be the data type that you declare as the output type for that trait implementation. So feel free to play around with these traits, but this is how you can do operator overloading in the Rust programming language. Thank you so much for watching. Again, please leave a like on this video if you learned something new or if you just enjoyed the presentation. Also, please subscribe to the channel. I'm an independent content creator, so your support is very meaningful to me. And then also, please leave a comment down below and let me know what you thought of this video. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.